The principal of the orphanage led me to two guys who were holding hands. He said it was Sam and Mark, my new dads. I tried to look surprised, as if seeing them for the first time. <gasps> After all, this was all part of our plan with the guys. The principal handed over my documents to the fathers, and I got into the smart sports car of my friends. Handsome Sam and Rudolph Mark, we were in the car, and I was so happy. I broke out of the orphanage, and now I was free. Since childhood, I remembered only a strict schedule, <laughs> the same uniform, and the most terrible thing, the minute-by-minute -minute supervision of the teachers. How I dreamed of immersing myself in a life full of freedom, expensive things, and parties. But time passed, and I was still stuck in the orphanage. And when I was desperate, I met two guys on the internet, Mark and Sam. They had been best friends since childhood, even sharing a Facebook account. Mark was so bold, so brutal, but Sam was a handsome guy, every girl's dream. We texted for hours, and I could only envy their life, cool clubs, expensive clothes. And so, two weeks ago, when I was once again yelled at by the teachers, I called Mark and Sam in tears. I was saying I hated this place, and then Sam said he thought he had an idea. His lawyer friend would forge their marriage registration papers, and he and Mark would pretend to be a couple in a dock meeting. Then I would be able to leave the orphanage. And now our plan had succeeded. Now I was heading in a cool car straight to a new life. But then Mark breaked abruptly. Have we arrived? Wow. wow. What a house. It was a real castle with a pool on the roof. As soon as we were inside, handsome Sam handed me a golden card. Are you sure this is for me? He added that it was an unlimited card. Hmm. I started thinking. Was it just like that? Although we were friends. I was going to run to the mall right now and buy everything there. But just as I was out in the yard, Mark yelled at me to be home for dinner. He wanted to talk to me. Come on, I'll make it. I didn't know where to look first in the store. There were so many cool things here. After shopping, I went to a restaurant and ordered the most expensive dishes. God, I've never eaten so good. I was so carried away that I didn't get home until late in the afternoon. I completely forgot about the dinner Mark was talking about. But Mark immediately complained that we were already late for the case. I stared at him in surprise. What kind of case was this? Oh, yes, I remember something like that. Brutal Mark and Handsome Sam looked at each other maliciously. I didn't understand anything. Then Sam said coldly, It's time for you to find out about our business. The tone made me feel creepy. The guys gathered around me and quietly said that they earned money from thefts. So that's where they got the money. Mark added that they had been in the business for a long time. And for new robberies, they needed someone small and agile, just like you. Handsome Sam said slowly, was this a joke? But the guys fled with each other to tell me that I would have so much money that I could buy anything I wanted. I thought about it. I realized that I was in trouble and there was no way back. Or rather, there was. But it led to the orphanage. Then handsome Sam chuckled. Look, you're thinking. You're not all that right. Yes, of course. I hated the rules with all my heart. Besides, who didn't want easy money? So guys, I'm in. At midnight, we got in the car. We're going to rob a jewelry store today, Handsome Sam said. Wow, this was really crazy. I played along with the guys and was just in shock from what was happening. And then Brutal Mark turned to me in a terrible bull mask. Handsome Sam handed me similar to it. He said it was their thing and it was necessary for conspiracy. I immediately pulled it over my head, and at that moment, I experienced a strange feeling, a sense of freedom. I liked that feeling. I didn't obey anyone, not even the law. We got out of the jewelry store, and I looked around in amazement. This was the coolest part of the city. They were just nuts. But Brutal Mark abruptly told me to focus. I needed to get inside the store and open the door for them from the inside. But how? Handsome Sam said they'd thought it all out. There was ventilation above the jewelry room. I would get into the room through it. <laughs> That's it? You can be sure I can handle it. I kept getting into the taste. While the guys unscrewed the gate around the corner of the building, I looked at the window. What gorgeous diamonds. But Mark called out that everything was ready, and I went over to them. The ventilation system stank wildly. How gross. But I whispered to Sam that after the case, I could pick up any earrings. This was my dream. So, despite my disgust, I went inside anyway. I couldn't get enough air from the cramped space, and suddenly something furry ran down my arm. God, the rat! I flinched and touched a ventilation hatch underneath me. 
It opened and I immediately fell down. No. <sighs> I managed to grab something and hung right over the shop floor. I looked down, and I noticed red laser arm lines all over the room. God, if I brush against them, we're dead. I frantically looked around the room and noticed a nearby sofa for visitors. There were no rays there. I hoped I was strong enough. I swayed and jumped on it. Oh god. I was just like a real spy. Then I crawled past the lasers to the door and opened a lock. Bruno went to the alarm panel, entered some password, and the lasers in the hall went out. They were really pros. Then he shoved it back into my hands and told me to go to the cash register to take out the money, and they would take care of the shop window. Wow. I opened the cash register and was finally overwhelmed by a wave of delight. Damn. I'm so cool. And now, it's all ours. But then I looked up and saw that Mark had touched the shop window, and a second later, the alarm went off. It seems they then turned everything off. Let's get out! Mark shouted in exasperation. The euphoria and romance left me abruptly. And I was just numb at the thought of being taken to prison. Sap grabbed me and dragged me to the car. We drove at full speed, and I still couldn't catch my breath. We were on the verge of going to jail. I couldn't sleep a wink all night. I needed to get out of here before I ended up in jail. I quickly began to pack my things in my backpack, and I would take that bag of money from the jewelry store. I almost died because of it. I crept into Mark's room and started looking for it. Man, where's the bag? I accidentally hit a tin can and it clattered under the bed. God, if Mark woke up now, I would be dead. I pressed myself against the wall, but I think I was okay. And then I noticed the handle of the bag. I grabbed it and crawled to the door. Freedom was only a few steps away. I opened the door. That's it. Done. Yes. Suddenly I heard Mark's voice behind me. Then he grabbed my arm. I tried to explain myself as I went along, but Mark said angrily that if I tried to run away, they would turn me into the cops as a criminal. What? How dare you? Mark pressed me against the wall and continued. They would say that since my arrival, valuable things had started to disappear from the house. And who would they believe? Them or a hooligan girl from an orphanage? I wanted to cry from impotence. He threw me into the room and said we had a new case tonight. We would clean out the fashion store. The guys locked me in my room for the day. It was unbearable. In the evening, Mark dragged me back to the car. There were tears in my eyes. This was not the freedom I dreamed of. We drove up to the store and Mark said I should spray paint the cameras. And if I tried to do something, they would hurt me. Brutal Mark easily opened the lock and we went into the store. Wow, there are such huge balls here. I glanced at the door, but Mark pushed me sharply toward the cameras. I waited for the brutal Mark to move away and began waving my hands at the camera. I wish someone would notice me and save me. But then Sam turned around and asked me how I was doing. I frantically began to spray paint on the camera, and then I got an idea. What if I just pretended to paint over the cameras? Then the guys would be spotted and put in jail, and I wouldn't have to help them anymore. I only needed to choose the moment and pull off their masks, then the camera would capture their faces. So I did. The guys were so busy raking money out of the cash register that they didn't even notice anything. There was no time to delay, so I jumped up to handsome Sam and was about to pull off his mask when he suddenly twisted my arm. I screamed at the sharp pain, but he covered my mouth. And at that moment, handsome Sam noticed that the cameras were not painted over. He was furious. Oh no, they understood. I ran for the exit, but Bruno Mark blocked my path. My heart was pounding. Brutal Mark angrily hissed that I decided to set them up for the second time, and they did not forgive this. And then I noticed an alarm button on the wall. I reached out and pressed it, but nothing happened. The next thing I knew, Mark was grabbing me and tying me up, and then taping my mouth shut. The guys dragged me to the car through the back door and threw me in the trunk. I was sitting in the trunk. Awesome. My freedom ended before it even started. Apparently, it served me right. I played too much and crossed the line, and they would probably dump me in some lake somewhere. My sad thoughts were interrupted by the sharp sound of sirens. It was the cops! The button worked! I heard one of them approach the guys and ask something, but Sam innocently replied that they had just arrived. 
I pounded on the trunk door as hard as I could, but no one heard me. Judging by the footsteps, the cops were already leaving. Heck, I braced myself and kicked the inside of the taillight. It worked! I knocked it out and managed to stick my hand through the hole from the taillight. The guys had already started the car. Sam pulled away and we drove off. Everything inside me collapsed. Now it was definitely over. Images from the orphanage began to flash through my mind. And for a moment, I even felt warmer in my heart. Heck, I would give anything to have everything back as it was. Suddenly, the car turned sharply somewhere and stopped. What happened? Someone opened the trunk and I was immediately blinded by the light of a flashlight. No! No! Don't touch me! I shouted. It was the cops. Looks like I just got lucky. But at the police station, one of the cops came up to me and said cheerfully, Well done. You know the first rule of kidnapping? Knock out the taillight from the inside and call for help. He saw me, went after the car, and saved me from Mark and Sam. It turned out that the cops had been looking for these bull gang rappers for a long time. And I burst into tears. Was this nightmare finally over? Was I really free? A week later, I came to the court to give evidence. I breathed a sigh of relief when I heard that Mark and Sam were going to jail. At the exit, the teacher from the orphanage was waiting for me. I was wildly happy to see her and rush to hug her. She was extremely surprised by my behavior. You know, during this adventure, I realized that freedom was not fashion boutiques, earrings, and certainly not crimes. Being free means learning responsibility and appreciating what you already have. Think about it. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. My friend Leo appeared in the doorway of the house, followed by the woman from the custody service. She said I would have three fathers now. What? Then two twins, who looked to be in their 20s, came out to us. Leo introduced them. These were Toby and Mike, his best friends, and they would also be my guardians. Did I get adopted by three people? Was that even possible? However, the guys immediately invited me to lunch. I was very hungry, but there was only instant noodles on the table. And I remembered how my mother used to cook. A lump rose in my throat. A couple of months ago, my parents died in a car accident. Everyone was saying that I needed to move on with my life. But how? The children from the orphanage did not accept me. I was withdrawn and shy. And when I thought that nothing good would happen in my life, my old friend Leo wrote to me. I had been running an Instagram page for a long time and there I pour my heart out in posts. Once he subscribed to me and we began to communicate. Despite the difference of four years, it was always very easy with him. He was the only person who understood me and he was so naive and kind, just like a child. When Leo found out about my tragedy, he urged me to move on with my life and try to go to the medical school I had so longed for. And indeed, it turned out that my parents left me savings to pay for college. But alas, according to the law, only the guardians who would adopt me could get them. Leo cryptically replied that he knew how to help. He had his own house, so he could take over custody. God, Leo, are you serious? And now I was sitting in the kitchen and I couldn't believe that Leo and I had made it. But three guardians were too much, of course. But come on, I decided to thank Leo and start by washing the dishes. But Leo decided to help me. Guys don't like washing dishes, do they? He was humming a tune, and I was embarrassed to say that he had a very pleasant voice. Leo smiled. He wanted to record his song for a long time, but his guitar was broken, and he didn't have enough money for the one he dreamed of. It was expensive. Lowering his eyes, he said that they were now on a tight budget, but he added that I would not need anything. Oh, Leo, for me, the main thing is that you are near. I fell asleep with a feeling that I was in my place, but in the morning, as soon as I opened my eyes, the twins burst into the room with a phrase that today I would clean the house according to the schedule. This wasn't how I imagined my first day in a new family, but I quickly gathered my Myself. After all, the guys took me in. I was dusting when I found a bag of balloons under the table. They seemed to know it was my birthday tomorrow. I smiled, but there was a knock on the door. A loader was standing in the doorway with a huge box. New TV? Wow, it could cover half of the wall and had a camera. And Leo said they didn't have much money. The twins fussed and said that they didn't have money. And Mike had won this TV in the lottery. Wow, cool. What a lucky guy. During the cleaning, the day passed unnoticed. And before I went to bed, I was already looking forward to Leo and the guys congratulating me in the morning. However, this did not happen. Confused, I went down to breakfast and heard the twins loudly discussing some party. Wow. 
So there would also be a surprise party? I pretended not to hear anything. I wanted to go for a walk, but the twins suddenly blocked my path. What happened? Toby handed me the money and the list of groceries. And Mike said I needed to buy them all, and quickly. I was in shock. Did they send me out for groceries on my own birthday? I was so taken aback that I couldn't argue. In the store, it turned out that the most expensive products were on the list. Not everyone could afford them. But I immediately checked myself. The guys were trying for me. Anticipating the fun, I dragged my back home and opened the door. But there were already a bunch of strangers hanging out in the room. Looked like the twins were going to announce that I was the birthday girl. But Toby just barked that everyone was already hungry. And I could go to my room and let them hang out. Wait, wasn't this a holiday for me? Tears of resentment welled up in my eyes. Had Leo forgotten about me too? I didn't expect that from him. Depressed, I went to my room and suddenly heard my name. I listened. Mike was bragging to his brother Toby. I would have taken someone under guardianship before if I knew how much money it would bring. We'll take all her money and then we'll find a new victim, he said. What? The front door slammed. It was Leo. He immediately came up to me and shyly handed me a box with a large bow. I quickly opened it and could not believe my eyes. There was a microscope. This was the one I needed to get into college. Unable to contain my emotions, I rushed to Leo, and he gently hugged me and goosebumps ran through my body. Leo asked anxiously why I was so sad on my birthday. I hesitated and timidly replied that it looked like the twins were spending the money my parents had left me. But Leo's face changed, and he added that the twins were his best friends. They would never do that. I was so hurt. Why don't you believe me? Then Mike and Toby appeared on the steps. They seemed to have heard everything. Just looking at them made the cold sweat break out on my forehead. I pushed Leo away and ran to my room. Guys stole from me. I had to report it to the police. I picked up the phone with trembling hands. Damn, my hands are shaking. They pounded on my door and soon there was a loud crunch. Toby broke the flimsy latch. He grabbed my phone and shouted that if I wanted to complain about something, I would regret. Guests began to flock to my room. It looked like they heard something. Oh, teenage whims. Toby told them sarcastically. He left, and I was still shaking. I couldn't go outside. The twins were just playing video games in the living room. Yes. That's right, the console. The new TV had a camera. If I could record their conversation, it would serve as proof for Leo. For the next half day, I tried to get timing right when the twins wouldn't be watching TV. Then I heard them go into the kitchen to get some chips. I didn't have much time, so I immediately went down to the TV and turned on the camera with trembling hands. I think it worked. All I had to do was sneak back to my room. What are you doing here? Suddenly I heard above me. I was stunned. When Mike was standing very close, he continued, We'd rather you buy us something else with your money instead of just hanging around. So he didn't understand what I was doing here. I glanced at the camera. The light was on and the recording was still going on. The guys were happy and discussed their new life at my expense. I felt elated. Soon Leo would know the truth. I knew that he would support me and protect me. Just like my dad did. Tears swelled up in my eyes again. As soon as Leo returned, I immediately pulled him to the TV in anticipation. I turned on the recording. Mike was already on the screen. I froze. And suddenly, black screen. I was stunned. Leo, it looks like the camera's turned off. I'm not lying to you. But Leo only said sadly that he was very disappointed. How could I say these lies about his best friends? Lowering his eyes, he added that he had a very different opinion of me. I had a terrible sinking feeling. The person closest to me thought I was a liar. The next morning, the twins made me wash all their shoes. And when Toby saw a spot on his sneaker. He yelled that if it wasn't for the money, they would have thrown me out for sure. Suddenly, I heard someone moving in the corridor. I was desperate. In tears, I wandered into the bathroom to wash his sneakers. Why do I need all this? Even Leo doesn't believe me. Suddenly, Leo came into the bathroom. It turned out that he had returned for the wallet and had heard everything. Leo started to apologize for not believing me right away. And then he added that now he would never let me offend. But we needed proof. Then the brothers would be deprived of their guardianship rights. Leo, I won't let you down this time. All I wanted was to win back his trust. Surprisingly, I felt more than just gratitude for him. Leo helped set up the camera on the TV, and we waited for the brothers. As soon as they entered, I blurted out, Why did you take custody of me if you wanted a slave? Toby just grinned at me. I could not prove anything. Yes, of course. Let's see. 
We checked. Everything was recorded this time. In the morning, Leo said that the four of us were going to the amusement park in honor of my last birthday and winked at me. The guys jumped in the back of the car, and Mike immediately started making stupid jokes about me. But Leo snapped at him to apologize immediately. The boys yelled in disgust. At that moment, we were approaching the police station. Toby's twin immediately rushed to the car door handle, but I managed to block it. The police were already approaching us, and while the surprised brothers were being handcuffed, Leo handed the sheriff a flash drive with the video. As we watched the twins go, Leo turned to me, looked me in the eye, and gave me a gentle hug. Then he added that we could finally live together. I felt my cheeks turn red. I was the happiest person on the planet that night. The twins were deprived of their rights to my custody and they were obligated to pay the money spent. Leo and I were so happy about it. I started a new life. But alas, the joy was not long. A few days later, we got a call from custody saying that due to a legal accident, Leo could no longer be my guardian. Tomorrow I would be picked up by a new guardian from another city. This was the end. All night, I could not find a place. After all, I was losing a dear person again. Tears were choking me. But I suddenly realized that I just had to thank Leo for everything. I got up early and immediately rushed to the music store. I was supposed to meet Leo for the last time in an hour. And when I saw him, I couldn't help but cry. He seemed broken too. With trembling hands, I handed Leo the guitar he'd been craving. Leo was taken aback and tried to refuse the gift. But I tried to smile through my tears and said that he was the dearest person in my life. And I wanted him to remember me. Leo was calm and silently smiled. What? Leo, don't you care? Suddenly, someone touched me on the shoulder. I almost jumped in surprise. A young man was standing nearby. He said he was my new guardian and nodded to Leo. What does it mean? Leo gently wiped away my tears and told me I shouldn't have worried so much. It turned out that my new guardian was an acquaintance of his. Having learned that he could be deprived of guardianship, had a deal with him that no one else would take me away. It turned out that he would only be my guardian according to documents, and I would live with Leo. But not officially. I burst into tears of happiness. Leo hugged me and whispered softly, but first I had to pretend that my guardian was taking me away, so that the guardianship service would not suspect anything. And in the evening, he would pick me up. I replied, jokingly. Alright daddy, goodbye, I love you. Did you like the video? Then subscribe and like it. Support the channel, thank you. I ran into my sister's room. She had another heart attack and she was sitting and filing her nails. Sis, are you okay? Claire was very happy and quickly said that she had a task for me. Anything you want. I blurted out, but immediately regretted it. Claire asked me to take her place at the meeting with her fiancé. We were twins. Are you crazy? I'm not going anywhere with this spoiled jerk. Claire immediately clutched her heart and began to wail. Tonight, she had an important meeting with Bruce's father, Mr. Wayne. If all went well, Bruce would propose to Claire. And all I needed to do was to take her place while the real Claire was in the hospital. Well, no. Claire pleaded. Her treatment was very expensive and her parents were about to lose the house for debt. After marrying rich Bruce, we would have a fortune. Don't you want to help our family? Claire asked defiantly. Of course, I would do anything for the family. My sister interrupted me and began to give me instructions on how to behave. And she sent me the change. Bruce will be at our house in an hour. You should look stunning. Once again, I followed my sister's lead and got into an adventure. I hated her since I was a kid. She was always bossing me around like a senior, even though she was only born three minutes before me. How was I going to play Claire anyway? She was glamorous and confident. And I was clumsy plain Jane. How was I going to be able to match her buoyant boyfriend? But there was not much I could do. Now I had not to screw up and help the family. I ran home as fast as I could. And just as I was putting on my dress, Bruce's fancy car appeared under the windows. I was afraid that he would quickly understand everything, but Bruce didn't seem to notice and just kept hugging me. I can't stand him. He gave me instructions on how to behave the whole drive. Thank you. I've already been told everything. Shut up already. When we arrived at the mansion, Mr. Wayne was standing at the entrance, swearing horribly at the gardener. Yes, I would definitely have a hard time. I exhaled and forced a smile. I should be clear. I was moving towards Mr. Wayne when I suddenly tripped over a statue in the garden. I fell to the ground, and Mr. Wayne immediately rushed to the statue. Damn, its arm fell off. While Bruce helped me up, his father scolded me. How could I be so clumsy and inattentive? 
Bruce introduced me to his father and tried to lighten the situation by making an awkward joke that I might be clumsy, but I was a living person, not a statue. Bruce's father smiled tightly and trying to change the subject, asked me how yesterday's event had gone. What was he talking about? Claire hadn't told me anything. I panicked and blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. Dances were rousing. But Mr. Wayne looked at me like I was a fool and said, At the conservatory? I thought about how to get out of it, but surprisingly, Bruce helped me. He said that the conductor had been so emotional that he had been dancing at the music stand. I looked at Bruce with gratitude. He had just saved me. Mr. Wayne said I wasn't much of a conversationalist. But Bruce told him I was a great golfer. Mr. Wayne was very happy and offered to play. I had never held a golf club in my life. Terrified, I trudged to the field. Bruce gave me a case of clubs, and I took the first one I could find. I closed my eyes, swung with all my strength, and heard a terrible scream. Heck! I think I broke Mr. Wayne's nose. I immediately rushed to apologize, but he roughly pushed me away and headed for the house. I wanted to cry out of desperation. I drew in everything. Now Mr. Wayne would never let Claire marry his son. I was thinking about what to say to Claire when Bruce came up to me. I waited for his anger, but he just laughed. Cool hit, by the way. I couldn't help but smile too. Wow. And Bruce was not such a bore. Then the butler called us to supper. Mr. Wayne was silent at the table, apparently still angry with me. Of course, I understand him. Trying to make conversation, I complimented one of the dishes. In response, Mr. Wayne arrogantly asked if I could cook the same way. I confusedly admitted that I didn't know how to cook. Bruce's father said disgustedly that a woman's place was in the kitchen and told me to wash at least the dishes. He pointed to the plates. Well, you know, this is too much. In my anger, I shouted at Wayne that he was a tyrant and a misogynist. Wayne turned purple with anger and told me to get out. Oh my god, what have I done? What's going to happen to Claire now? I ran out of the mansion in tears. Bruce caught up with me at the gate. He said dryly that he had to go. I tried to apologize but Bruce cut me off. We hit the highway, and then Bruce took a sharp turn into the woods. It was already dark and I was filled with fear. Was he going to kill me there? I tried to ask Bruce where we were going, but he didn't say anything. Suddenly, we stopped. My heart was pounding. Cautiously, I opened the door and got out of the car. And suddenly, a fantastic view of the city opened in front of me. How beautiful. Then Bruce said there was no better place to... He paused. To what? Bruce got down on one knee and took the ring out of his pocket. He said I was the bravest girl he'd ever met. His father had no authority for a long time. He was always not happy with everything. So even if his father didn't approve of our wedding, Bruce still wanted to marry me. I was a wonderful, honest girl. What? I had never been told such words. So I did it. My sister Claire would soon recover. And my parents would still have their home. Yes, of course, I agree. And then Bruce kissed me. What? I didn't expect this and at first even tried to dodge. But then I relaxed and gave myself to feelings. I wanted to kiss to last forever. We watched the sunset for a while longer and then returned to the city. I didn't want to go home at all, so we went for a walk along the old streets. Bruce told me interesting things about houses. He knew a lot about architecture. I liked Bruce more and more. I had no idea that he could be so interesting. Bruce drove me home in the early morning. We kissed again, and elated, I ran into the house and bumped into Claire. She was getting better, and she had already been discharged. Damn, I'd forgotten about my sister. Well, so now, am I the bride? She asked sharply. I remembered my kiss with Bruce and blushed. Unable to answer, then Claire noticed the ring. Diamonds! She exclaimed happily and unceremoniously pulled a ring off my finger. Claire said with a grin that she was pleased with me. For once, I didn't screw up, but then she would do it on her own. The next week, Claire was busy preparing for the wedding. She was in such a hurry to get married that the wedding celebration was decided to be held in a month. I kept thinking about Bruce. On the one hand, I felt guilty for deceiving him. On the other hand, I couldn't believe I'd been so happy with him that night just when I thought I was beginning to forget. Claire brought him to meet our parents. I was terrified. I had to stay in my room all evening. Even though Bruce knew about a twin sister, Claire told me to steer clear. But even in my room, I could hear Claire bossing Bruce. 
I put on my headphones so I wouldn't have to hear it all. And then the door opened and Bruce came in. He paused in the doorway. Confused. God, did he recognize me? But Bruce explained that he was looking for a bathroom. He was about to leave when he suddenly paused. For a second, I thought Bruce recognized me and he was going to give me a big hug. Of course, dream on. But instead, Bruce said that he was happy to meet me and hoped to see me at the wedding. I was in a lot of pain, but I agreed, fighting back tears. It was time to understand that Bruce did not love me, but my sister. On the eve of the ceremony, Claire persuaded me to go to the bachelorette party. But because of cocktails, she was free and easy. She called Bruce a rich kid and promised her friends a cool car at his expense. I felt sick and angry. Bruce didn't deserve to be treated like this. He was a great guy, not a bag of money. I took out my phone. He had to know the truth. But Claire snatched the phone out of my hands, shouting that I probably really wanted our parents to lose our house. And then she clutched at her heart. Stop faking it, Claire. I'm not buying it. I was already dialing the number, but Claire suddenly turned pale and fell to the floor. Oh my god, she was really feeling bad. I called an ambulance and we rushed to the hospital. The doctors were examining Claire and I kept walking up down the hall. And then the doctor came out. Finally, he was worried. He said that because of the frequent attacks, Claire's heart was very worn out and she needed an expensive operation for the next time the heart valve might fall. Oh my god. I ran to the ward. With the last of her strength, Claire called me over, calling me her favorite sister for the first time. She begged me to replace her at the wedding. I was so torn between my pain for my sister and my feelings for Bruce. Emotions overwhelmed me, so without answering, I ran out of the room. And here I was, standing at the altar in a gorgeous wedding dress. Bruce was there, so beautiful, so desirable, and now so inaccessible. A few more minutes and he would be Claire's husband. I'd rather give her my heart if I could. Can I save my sister only at the cost of a lie? The priest started talking about true love and I realized I couldn't fool Bruce like that. Stop! I shouted. The priest froze in disbelief and the guests began to exchange glances. I threw up my veil and told Bruce everything. That Claire was in the hospital and I was Jane, her sister. And then at the meeting with his father, it wasn't Claire either. But me. I paused, unable to say a single word. I thought that Bruce would be furious. But suddenly he kissed me. I didn't understand what was going on. Bruce. Then he leaned over and whispered to me that he had noticed a change in Claire since the day I met his father. But he liked his Claire. Brave and strong, much more. And then he said out loud that it was with me that he wanted to be. I felt like I stopped breathing. Bruce nodded to the priest, who continued the ceremony, asking if I would take Bruce as my husband. I froze for a second, then said no. The whole room gasped, and Bruce was stunned. I told him honestly about Claire's operation and her parents' debts. I didn't want Bruce to think I was using him for money. I could handle it all by myself and save the family. Tears welled up in my eyes and I tried to leave. But Bruce grabbed my arm. He said that he would definitely help me and debts were not a reason to cancel the wedding. After all, he really loved me. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely happy, I kissed Bruce. Looking at us, the priest smiled. I think we can continue the ceremony. And I suddenly realized, the main thing is to follow your heart. It will always tell you the right way. We exchanged rings and started kissing. Did you like the video? Then subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. We ran forward as fast as we could, but we must not stop. The cannibals have almost caught up with us. The wall that separated the city from the rest of the island was a kilometer away. We have to make it at any cost. Sam and I are journalists, and we came here to do a story about the cannibal city. I was sure it was just a rumor, but now the crowd of savages was almost upon us. In desperation, I turned to the site. There was an abandoned shopping center. Sam followed, still holding the camera. I looked around the room frantically. There was no point in running to the shops. There were no glasses in the windows for a long time, and suddenly I saw an elevator. We ran to it and I pressed the button. The elevator still wasn't moving. I looked around and was horrified to see that the mall had been invaded by a crowd. And then the elevator doors creaked open. Sam and I jumped in and I pressed the close button. The doors were closing so slowly and the cannibals were already running towards us. This was the end. I already started going over the images of my life. And why did we just come here? I always wanted to be a well-known journalist and went head over heels. So when I heard about the Cannibal Island scandal, I realized this was my chance to become famous. 
the government had enclosed the captured city with a wall and no one dared to enter it. And I decided. And my obnoxious colleague Sam stuck with me. That's how we ended up in this hellish place. I was turtled out of my reverie by one of the savages grabbing my leg. I felt a piercing pain from the fingernails and screamed, but with the last of my strength, I kicked him with my other foot. How painful. He jumped back as the elevator door finally slammed shut. We made it, Sam. He kicked the bottom board with all his might, and the elevator blinked. Now the doors couldn't be opened. They were jammed, and we could get out through the hatch into the shaft. We're safe, Sam said. But the beasts continued to pound on the door anyway, and every time they hit the elevator, I flinched. I looked at Sam, and he suddenly turned the camera to my leg. What? I looked down, my head spinning. The whole leg was torn and covered in deep marks. I immediately remembered the long, dirty fingernails of the cannibal that had clung to me, and my heart sank. Before that, probably because of fear, I didn't even feel pain. But now my leg felt like it was burning. Sam took a close-up of it. I almost started to cry, but then Sam hugged me, and he said that the leg would heal up, and we would definitely survive, and there was no way he was going to leave me. I was ashamed for a second, because I thought Sam was a cold, calculating egotist. And now he took care of me. He even tore off the sleeve of his shirt and bandaged my wound. He recorded everything on the camera, and the cannibals continued to break into the door. I didn't know what to do. We couldn't get out while these beasts were watching us, and we couldn't stay here forever either. But there were no other options. We opened our backpacks, stew, water, bars, if anything that was enough for two days. And I checked my phone, but of course there was no connection. Sam filmed my every action. The banging on the door only got worse. The cannibals seemed to be losing their temper. I started to panic. Sam suddenly said that when we got out, we'd get fame in the Best Reporter Award. After all, we were the first to show unique footage from the island of cannibals. His words calmed me down a little. Yes, I will be the best. I'll surpass everyone who said I wasn't amount to anything. All I had to do was get out. The cannibals were banging harder. I panicked again, so did Sam. We woke up almost in sync. What? Had we fallen asleep? How long did we sleep? Due to stress and fatigue, we just passed out. I could hardly remember what happened before. We listened. There was no more pounding on the door. Had they gone? But before I could be happy, I brushed against my bad leg and felt a sharp pain. My leg was already swollen. Almost crying, I showed Sam my leg, and it only made me feel worse. Sam just turned on the camera and made a stupid joke that I would soon turn into a cannibal. Perfect timing. I urgently needed antibiotics, but there was no first aid kit in my backpack for some reason. Maybe I dropped it during the chase. The only way out was to look for medicines in the shopping center. I knew that in a few hours, I wouldn't be able to stand on my feet. Sam agreed to come with me, but only if I caught it on a GoPro camera. That's not what I needed to think about right now, but I agreed. He put the GoPro on my head, and we listened. Everything was quiet. Sam carefully opened the hatch of the elevator. At the thought that we might run into the cannibals, the blood froze in my veins. Sam helped me out, and soon we were climbing out through the shaft. It was light outside, so we were out all night. I looked around and immediately noticed a sign. Pharmacy! Very close! But before I could take a step, a savage came around a corner and ran towards me, making terrible noises. Sam, back up! He immediately jumped into the shaft and crawled into the elevator. I followed him, and as soon as we had closed the hatch, the savage began to break into it. My heart was pounding, and my leg was aching. I began to think that I had an infection. The only way to escape was to get the medicine. I said this to Sam, but he mumbled that he had hit himself hard when he fell into the elevator, and now he couldn't walk. Strange, just a minute ago, everything was fine, but I knew that if I didn't get the antibiotic now, I'd be finished. The savage continued to pound on the elevator's hatch. Damn, I need to distract him somehow. I rummaged in my bag and found hairspray. I didn't think it would help me, but I felt a lighter in my pocket, and it hit me. I hope it works. I opened the hatch abruptly. The savage was already hissing and ready to attack. I immediately put the lighter under the spray. A flash of fire burned the cannibal, and he fell screaming into the shaft. Got it! I immediately got out and rushed to the pharmacy alone. When I got there, I immediately hid behind the shelf. I think it worked. No one chased me. There were still some drugs left on the shelves. I noticed the first aid kit on the floor and immediately grabbed it. 
At that moment, I looked out the window and saw our car. An emergency exit led directly to it from the pharmacy. If we get through the savages, we can get out of here. I just needed to get to Sam. I turned around and was stunned with horror. Right in front of me was a cannibal. I was so excited about the emergency exit that I didn't even hear him approach me. He was a centimeter away from me. But then I grabbed a bottle and hit him on the head. The beast twisted in pain, and I rushed to Sam. I got there quickly. Sam was there, and I breathed a sigh of relief. But then a hand reached out from above. The cannibal. God, I did close the hatch. I dropped my backpack and immediately slammed it shut and tried to hold on with all my strength. But the savage was stronger. Sam, help me. But he was in no hurry. My hands were getting weaker by the second, and I couldn't stand it and let go of the lid. At that moment, the savage who continued to pull it on himself fell into the shaft. <sighs> that was so close. I looked at Sam reproachfully. Why did he help me? But all Sam said was that he couldn't leave the camera, and that he acted that he had already examined the first aid kit. But it turned out that there were only empty bottles in it. Did I take the wrong box? There was another banging on the elevator door, and I was desperate. Tears welled up in my eyes, but Sam suddenly said I was so brave. Together, we would succeed, because I was the same as him. I was ready to do anything for the sake of a dream. His words cheered me up a little, and I quickly told Sam about the emergency exit at the pharmacy, and he was also very happy. We would get out of there soon. We decided to wait until nightfall, until the cannibals got tired of breaking through and left. To calm down, we told each other stories. Sam was a good conversationalist. However, he filmed on camera even this. But soon the battery was dead, and I hid it in my backpack. Right now, the main thing was to get out of there alive, and we already had a lot of shots. At some point, Sam shushed me. I think it's time. We quickly climbed out through the shaft. My heart was pounding. Sam, hush. Suddenly, shards of glass crunched loudly <gasps> under my feet. Oh no, they would wake up. Sam and I looked at each other, but the savages were nowhere to be seen. That was close. We tiptoed to the exit and I tried not to breathe, so as not to make any unnecessary sounds. And then we were out on the street, running as fast as we could to the car. But suddenly, Sam stumbled. As I helped him to his feet, a bottle of antibiotics fell out of his pocket. Stop. But you said the first aid kit was empty. Then Sam's face twisted into a grin. What's happening? He said he just didn't want to give up to me. What? Are you kidding? I might die. But Sam said that was what he wanted. After all, then all the glory would go to him, and I would remain a loser, a missing person, and he wouldn't have to push me into the hands of cannibals. The audience would only see how he tried to help me and bandage my wounds. I was taken aback, not believing his words, but then Sam abruptly snatched the backpack with the camera from me and ran to the car. I quickly picked up the bottle of antibiotics, swallowed the pill as I went, and ran after him. Oh no, Sam! And then he started shouting loudly. I realized with horror that he was waking up the savages. There were a lot of them in the dark and they woke up. Sam climbed into the car and I ran over and tried to handle, but it wouldn't budge. That bastard locked the doors. I was about to be torn to pieces. At that moment, he started the engine. No, it can't end like this. I ran after the cars as fast as I could and at the last moment, I clung to the trunk. Got it. I struggled to get on top of it, but Sam started maneuvering to throw me off. What are you doing? I held on as fast as I could. A pack of cannibals was running behind the car, and at any moment, I could fall right on top of them. But suddenly, the car jerked violently. There was a pop, and it stopped. What's happening? I jumped off the trunk, and I realized that the tire had burst. I started to panic. I looked back and saw the savages. Furious. They were too close. Limping, I ran to the gate in the wall. Come on, there's not much left. And when I was almost there, it hit me. Where was Sam anyway? I turned and saw that he had got out of the car and was barely dragging himself, and the savages were catching up with him. I wanted so badly to see Sam torn apart after his betrayal. He was ready to give me up for some shots. But then something inside me quivered. It wasn't long ago that I was ready to go head over heels for Fane too. I suddenly realized that people could be as good as savages. But no, I'm human. I made an effort and quickly returned to Sam. I took his arm and pulled him along. And all I could think was, if I had really spent my entire life neglecting others for my own purposes, just like Sam. There were only a couple of meters left. And here it was, the exit. We got out on last breath, and I managed to slam the gate shut. At the same moment, the cannibals began to drum wildly on it. 
Tears welled up in my eyes. We are saved. Is it really over? We went through so much for these shots. But Sam suddenly interrupted me and calmly said that the camera was left in the car. Couldn't believe it. Sam grinned enigmatically. Did you like the video? Then subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. The judge said that the decision was made and gaveled. That day, I adopted my boyfriend, Joe. We both had to stop ourselves from laughing. He really didn't have a mom. She died two years ago in some sort of bathroom accident. We went out on the street and Joe happily announced that I was now his mom and we burst out laughing. Since childhood, I adopted risk and dangerous challenges. It was boring to live without it. I tried to find an extreme sports fan like me, but Joe was so crazy that sometimes it was scary. But I definitely wasn't bored with him. Therefore, our relationship quickly turned into a plain chicken. You know, we did everything. I once even walked without the safety net on the wire between the skyscrapers. And he, for example, could eat a live frog. Now, Joe asked me to adopt him as a dare. If I got through a month and was a good mom, I could give Joe the next task. But if one of us refused the challenge, they would have to walk naked all over the city, and I really didn't want that. After the adoption challenge, we went to a coffee shop to celebrate, and Joe offered to live together since I was his new mom now. I agreed. At first, we hung out all the time and I loved it. I had been wanting to move out of my parents' house for a long time, but every day Joe was acting more and more strangely. When I did yoga, he would sit next to me and watch. I was cooking in the kitchen. He was sitting silently at the table. Even when I lingered in the bathroom, he would knock softly on the door and say, I think it's time for mommy to go out. Joe misses you. Oh no, Joe. You won't be able to get me off balance. I won't fail the challenge. One morning, I was getting ready for work and had just opened the door from my room when I saw Joe sitting in front of it. He was looking at me. I smiled and was about to leave when Joe grabbed my leg and told that mom should stay at home with her son. I didn't know. Joe was such a good actor. I played along, hugged him gently, and said, Joe, mommy needs to earn you some candy bars. Then he turned away and said viciously that I was acting just like his dead mother. I didn't think it was funny anymore. I ran quickly down the stairs, and I thought I heard Joe crying somewhere behind me. Flying into the office, I ran into my friend Eve. She suggested we go to the bar tonight. Yes, a little relaxation would definitely help. Joe was beginning to bother me. At the bar, even I talked to the bikers. The guys offered to give us a ride. Oh yes, that's what I need. We left the bar. I got on one of the bikes with a big guy, and the race started. We raced through the city, and I felt happy. Not for long though. When I pulled out my cell phone, I saw 35 missed calls from Joe. Damn, what if something happened? I immediately asked the biker to take me home. As I entered the hall, I saw Joe sitting in the dark on the stairs. He slowly stood up and began to approach me. I was scared, and he stared into my eyes and clenched his fist. He hissed that mommy shouldn't be home so late. I answered him with disbelief. You're out of your mind because of this challenge. But Joe suddenly grabbed my hand and squeezed it so hard that I screamed. I thought he was going to break it. But Joe jerked back and almost burst into tears. He began to apologize for being selfish and his mother was right to scold him for it. What? I didn't scold anyone. Joe vowed to be better and trudged back to his room, constantly repeating the words, Mom, sorry. I locked myself in and decided to dial Eve. I felt uneasy and decided to tell her all about Joe's antiques. Eve said it sounded like Joe really had some kind of mental problem. This was no longer a simple challenge. She advised me to leave as soon as possible. Who knows what else he might be capable of? Her words made me uneasy. I used to think Joe was just good at acting. But now I was starting to doubt it. I knocked on Joe's door. Silence. Summoning my resolve, I said that we would need to finish this game. I was terribly worried, and I was waiting for him to tell me that I would have to go naked all over the city. But Joe suddenly opened the door and started hugging me. Joe, what are you doing? Mommy, don't go. Don't leave Joe alone. He continued. Then I put my hand on his shoulder and said softly, Joe, this is just a game. You're worrying too much. But then Joe stopped talking and pulled away. A sinister smile slowly spread across his face. Joe, stop it. This isn't funny anymore, okay? 
I was about to leave when Joe grabbed my arm and whispered that I was a bad mom. Let me go. I broke free and ran out of the room, heading for the stairs. I kept looking back at the distraught Joe. He followed me slowly. I was running downstairs, but suddenly I tripped and fell down. My vision went dark. I woke up in my bed. I was wearing a nightgown and Joe was carefully adjusting the blanket. I half rose. But he looked at me intently and put me back down. I'll take care of mommy. Joe said slowly. The words sent a shiver down my spine. With a trembling voice, I asked for water. When he left, I frantically searched for my phone. Fortunately, it rang on the nightstand. I saw the number on the screen. It was Eve. But before I could pick up the phone, I heard Joe's voice. Well, well. He came over, took the cell phone, and threw it at the wall. The impact made me wince. If Joe broke my phone so easily, what could he do to me? Then Joe whispered that mommy should think about her behavior. Then he went out and the key turned in the lock. Joe locked me up. I immediately ran to the door and started pounding on it with my fists and pulling on the handle, but to no avail. Can I escape through the window? But then I noticed that Joe had taken the handles off the windows. I started to panic, and suddenly I heard the roar of an engine. Eve's car appeared under the windows. She got out of the car and rang the doorbell. This was my chance to escape. I knocked on the window and actively waved my hands. Come on, Eve, look up. At that moment, Joe came out to Eve, smiling. Eve was worried about why I wasn't picking up the phone, but Joe said in a sweet voice that I wasn't feeling well and I was sleeping. I was banging on the window and I was hoping that Eve would look up after all, but she just shrugged her shoulders and went to the car. I felt doomed. Help me! I yelled in hysterics. Suddenly, the door to the room opened. Joe grabbed me by the hair and dragged me to the bed and handcuffed me, saying that his mother was behaving very badly. I screamed and struggled, but Joe just spat at my head and told me that soon mommy would calm down and he would live again as before and always be together. Joe came out and I was still twitching and screaming for help. I wanted to cry. I loved extreme sports, but this was too much. What should I do? Joe was a real nutcase. He didn't play, but then an idea came to me. What if I played along? When Joe came to check on me, I told him I'd figured it out. Mom promises to take care of Joe if he will be obedient and take the handcuffs off. My voice was shaking and my heart was ready to jump out of my chest. Joe thought for a moment, then finally released me and ordered me to feed him. Oh my god, it really worked! We went to the kitchen and I started making him porridge. I looked at Joe and gave him a tight smile. Then I handed him a plate. Joe was very happy, but as soon as he tasted the porridge, he got terribly angry, threw the plate into the wall, and started shouting at me. You're making porridge with lumps again. I was so scared. Joe, this is the first time I've made it. But he stared at me and told that mommy had already made Joe's porridge with lumps. They then had a big fight. His mom fell down and fell asleep in the bathroom forever. What? I fell asleep? Then Joe got up from the table and started walking towards me. Damn, and then I realized Joe had killed his mother. I blurted out that I was going to the bathroom. There I closed the flimsy latch and looked around. Damn it, damn it. I had to get out of here. Then I noticed a small window near the ceiling. I tried to open it, but at that moment, the door creaked. Joe was rushing to me, saying in a crazy voice that mom was too late again. In a fit of hysteria, I tried to smash the window with a mop, but at that moment, Joe burst in and started shouting. He wanted mommy to play with him. Tears welled up in my eyes. That's it. I'll never get out of here. Unless… Then I hugged Joe with trembling arms. Mommy had already made up a game for us. Joe, you're a brave boy, aren't you? He nodded thoughtfully. Prove it to your mom. Take a walk on the ledge of the roof for your mom. Can you? In horror. I waited for his answer, but he was suddenly happy and agreed. Joe climbed out of the window and onto the ledge, and I watched him. Come on, Joe. Mommy is proud of you. He looked at me with a smile, and I immediately closed the window and ran downstairs. Without looking back, I hurried to the police station. Tears streamed down my cheeks. The cops listened to me, and we drove back to the house. But when we entered, I was speechless. Joe was covered in bruises and torn clothes. At the sight of the police, he began to cry and pointed at me. Please don't give me to her. 
Joe complained that I adopted him just to mock him and even made him walk on the ledge. I interrupted him and started shouting, No way! Don't believe him! He wanted to kill me. I was so hurt. Of course, the cops believed Joe. He played so well. They said that I was deprived of the right to custody and took me to the police station. When they let me go, I went to see Eve. I flinched at every sound, afraid that Joe would attack me. But Joe was gone, and he didn't even show up for the trial, or I was fined and given community service. On the last day of my punishment, I returned to Eve with the news that I was moving to another city. I admitted that no matter where I was, I was afraid every day that Joe would attack me down there. And now I have been living a normal life without adrenaline for six months, and I gradually forget those terrible events. I have a job, an apartment, and even a new boyfriend. I was just on my way to a date when I stopped at a traffic light. Suddenly, I saw Joe across the street. He gave me a friendly wave. I was petrified with horror. I knew that the light would turn green and he would come to me. But a bus passed him. A second later, there was no one on the opposite street. I ran as fast as I could. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. I finished cleaning up and went to say goodnight to my younger brothers. But as soon as I entered their room, I was dumbfounded. The windows were open and the twins were nowhere to be found. Ted, Mike, where are you? In a panic, I searched the room. Empty. My god, had my brothers been kidnapped? It sounded crazy, but I just saw a video yesterday about sectarians who steal children. Terrified, I ran for the phone. I had to call the police as soon as possible. I was about to dial the number when I heard a rustle in the room. I flew in there and couldn't believe my eyes. Ted and Mike were lying quietly in their beds. Was this a prank? My heart almost broke. You can't do that. But my brother said they had been here all the time. You didn't look good, sis. Ted winked at me. Very strange. Maybe I really didn't notice. I guess I worried too much about them. I hadn't taken my eyes off since our mom died of cancer a year ago. I remember that the last time we met, she squeezed my hand and said in a barely audible voice, Take care of the boys. Our dad began to disappear even more at work to feed us. Then I realized I should support him and replace our mom. I even had to forget about the desire to become a teacher and take a sabbatical to fully take care of my brothers. The next morning, I decided to treat the boys with our mom's pancakes. It may not be the most healthy breakfast, but this was how the twins would remember our mom's care. In addition, dad went on a business trip again, and even on the eve of the holiday. So today, I was for both parents. Mike! Ted! It's all set! I called to my brothers. But there was no answer. It was strange. Then I went upstairs and looked into the room. There was no one inside. Hmm. Were my brothers pranking me again? I looked around in disbelief. There was an old book lying on the table. It was stained with something red. I stepped closer. Oh my god. It was blood. At that moment, I was really worried. I looked for my brothers all over the house. But they were nowhere to be found. What if they were stolen for real this time? In a panic, I started calling Ted and Mike's classmates, but no one saw them. It was Sunday. Exactly! I got caught up. It was as if something had snapped inside me. I called the police, but they said that my brothers were probably just out for a walk. No, you don't understand. I saw the blood. They're in danger. But the desk sergeant said that I could announce about the disappearance only in a day. Fighting back tears, I ran outside. I looked for my brothers in all the neighborhoods, knocked on the houses of friends, but no one knew anything. I had already visited all their favorite places, but the brothers were nowhere to be found. I had been looking for them all day. It was already dark. In desperation, I collapsed on a bench and burst into tears. How could I let this happen? Completely heartbroken, I trudged home, and then I noticed a shadow in the window of my brothers. I ran as fast as I could, and I saw Ted and Mike calmly reading comics. Lying in bed. The boys greeted me and asked casually when we were going to have dinner. I almost died of excitement. Where had they been and why were they pranking me again? But the twins looked at me like I was crazy. They'd been home all day. My head went blank. Apparently, I was really losing my mind. But that blood on the book, surely I wasn't imagining it. At breakfast, I asked the guys what kind of book it was, but the brothers said they didn't know what I was talking about, and they left the table and said they had to go to school. They were clearly not telling me something or even wanted to hide something from me. Determined, I went up to my brother's room. 
They must have hidden the book somewhere. But it was nowhere to be found. And suddenly there were footsteps on the stairs. Oh my god, were they thieves? In a panic, I tried to hide in the closet, but there were too many clothes there. Heck, the footsteps were very close. At the last moment, I ran to the bed and ducked under it. At the same moment, someone entered the room and two pairs of feet approached the bed. I froze with fear, but suddenly I heard the voices of my brothers. They were arguing about something. I was about to get out and scold them for their truancy. But then I heard Ted say, Mike, if we don't give the money back today, we're screwed. I was wary. What was he talking about? And then suddenly there was a loud sound. Something broke. A shark from the piggy bank flew under the bed, and the brothers began to collect coins from the floor. Man, if they turned around, they would see me. But the guy silently collected all the money and quickly ran away. I was terrified. Was someone extorting money from my brothers? I crawled out from under the bed and quickly ran outside. I wanted to call out to my brothers, but I realized that if they were intimidated, they would definitely not tell me anything. So I carefully began to watch them from a distance. I had to protect them. After a couple of blocks, the brothers turned a sharp corner and entered a dark alley. There were only garbage cans and dirty walls of houses around. And what did the brothers forget in this place? Heading behind one of the cans, I saw the brothers stop and stand at the shabby door. A guy in a white robe opened the door. God, who is this? Ted and Mike handed him the money, and he let them go inside, making a strange gesture with his hand. No, don't go in there. It's some kind of sect. But the brothers stepped inside, and the door slammed shut behind them. Trying to stop myself from shaking, I ran after them and pounded on the door with all my might. The door opened. The same sectarian stood on the threshold. He asked me menacingly what I wanted. Out of fear, I blurted out that I was new. I was afraid he'd throw me out. But the guy said grimly, come on in. When I went downstairs, I found myself in a basement hall with many doors. There were candles all around and there were strange noises coming out of the gloom, as if something was bubbling. Were they brewing some kind of potion? I need to get my brothers out of here. Suddenly, a woman ran out of one of the doors in tears, falling to her knees in front of me. She screamed that she had ruined everything. I helped her up, but the roped man immediately grabbed her and dragged her somewhere. Oh no, what were they going to do with her? I rushed to the door where she was taken, but some sectarian blocked my path. What if my brothers were there too? In anger, I grabbed the sectarian by the robe and began to shout, I want them back. But he coldly replied that the brothers would work out their order. What order? What was happening? In a panic, I began to rush around the hall and pull all the doors. They were closed. Ted, Mike, answer me please. The sectarian started toward me. He was almost upon me. But then one of the doors gave way. Flinging it open, I flew into the room and was taken aback. The roped men were standing around a huge cauldron. The sectarians noticed me and moved towards me in a frightening manner. Don't do that! I huddled in a corner. There was nowhere to run. You shouldn't be here, said one of them. Then they grabbed me by the arms and dragged me somewhere. I desperately tried to escape, but in the end, I was thrown out into the street. Let me in! My brothers are there! In tears, I pounded on the unfortunate door, but no one opened it for me. Suddenly, my phone rang in my pocket. It was our dad. He said he was flying in tonight to congratulate me. Man, I forgot. It was my birthday tomorrow. Dad asked anxiously how the boys were doing. I wanted to tell him everything. But if he found out that the guys disappeared because of my fault, he would never forgive me. Pretending to be happy, I lied that my brothers were at school and I was preparing food for the holiday table. Dad also asked me not to overwork. After all, the brothers were already grown and they needed to learn independence. I had time until the evening. I had to go to the police again. This time, they would definitely believe me. With the last of my strength, I ran to the nearest police station and shouted to the officer. My brothers were kidnapped by the sect. I saw it myself. The policeman promised to sort it out and sent me home. They would do everything. I went slowly towards the house when I suddenly felt someone gaze on me. I looked around. There was no one there, but I felt uneasy. I had already reached the house, but the feeling grew stronger. Just as I reached the door, I spun around and saw someone dart quickly into the bushes. But I caught a glimpse of the black hood. My god, it was a sectarian. He had tracked me down, and he was going to kill me as a witness. I quickly ran to the house and immediately burst in and locked the door. For defense, I grabbed a coat rack at the entrance. I won't just give up. Surprise!
I heard a chorus of voices. I screamed and frightened immediately dropped the coat rack on the floor. Dad was standing in the hall in front of me, and Ted and Mike were smiling next to him. How glad I was to see my brother safe and sound. I ran to them, overwhelmed with happiness, and hugged them tightly. But then the brothers looked at each other slightly. I immediately remembered everything and tried to look stern. So will he tell me what all this meant? And then the brothers confessed. They were just preparing a party for me. Wait, what about the blood on the book? The brothers smiled and explained that the book was an old collection of mom's recipes. Mike decided to make a strawberry cake, but ruined everything and only smeared the cover with juice. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. I turned pale with fear, but dad went to the door as if nothing had happened. I darted toward him. Stop! There's a sectarian! But it was too late. The man in the robe was already standing on the threshold. In a panic, I rushed to my brothers and covered them with myself. I turned around. The cultist was gone. What was happening? The twins said that these guys were not sectarians. They were secret order of pastry chefs. These guys wanted to stand out in the confectionery world. So they chose such an unusual uniform. They have the best cakes in town. Ted said proudly, and the most expensive ones. He added, so the brothers had to work out the price of the cake by sweeping the floors. At that moment, the guy from the order returned with a huge cake. Wow, it was made of white chocolate. I was ready to cry with happiness. You guys tried so hard to make me feel good. Dad invited the cook to celebrate with us. But he referred to urgent business and was about to leave when I remembered a woman who had been sobbing in the basement. Who was she? The cook looked at me intently, but then he smiled. That woman visited their courses. It's just that some people are very worried if they don't succeed at first. I suddenly felt embarrassed for my suspicions. I should trust people more. And I had to drop the charges today. Surprisingly, during the evening, the brothers took care of me and dad just like adults. Maybe I really shouldn't have worried so much. And dad was right. They had grown up and could take care of themselves. After all, I have a life of my own. Which means it's time to give my brothers more freedom. And it's high time for me to go back to university. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you.